Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 69 of the Ask Historians podcast. So today we are speaking with Alvise Falier about uh, really communal Italy, uh, or kind of uh, medieval era communes, uh, but really focusing in particularly on Milan and northern Italy at this time period. And, and we'll, I'll let our guest explain a little bit more what we mean by communal Italy and medieval communes and Milan as we go forward. But this is the first of kind of a two-part series that we're doing on, uh, on Italy, and really kind of on Italian nationalism as kind of the background theme of this. So I kind of want you to look at this episode as the first part of that, which looks at kind of the onset of modern Italian national disunity, the the idea that there's no singular Italian national idea. Uh, and then the next episode, we're going to jump several centuries ahead in time and look at, at Italy during uh, the period of the fascists and Mussolini and see how kind of there was this attempt to forge together a national identity uh, through a number of ways we're going to be looking at football. Uh, but for today, we're going to be looking at mainly medieval Milan and kind of the the, the fracturing of Italy uh, in Italy at this time underneath the, the Holy Roman Empire uh, into a sort of uh, localized polities and my city first, everyone else's city can kind of, you know, go suck eggs kind of mentality. Uh, and we'll look at the, kind of the details of how that worked out in Milan and how it kind of that that kind of... Uh, system of government or non-government in a way or cooperative collective government came about and then how it kind of crashed and burned and led to the uh, series of very brutal vicious wars that kind of encompassed the italy in the in the 15th century so uh, i hope you enjoyed the episode uh, a big thanks to everyone who is supporting us on patreon that is uh, patreon.com forward slash ask historians uh, you can go there if you want to support the show uh, we will be putting up as usual as always a discussion post on ask historians uh, on reddit after this uh, so uh, listen, enjoy, and if you have any questions, you can go to the discussion post. Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Ask Historians podcast. Today, I'm here with Alvise Falier, who uh, will be talking about, I guess, kind of communal Italy. Uh, it's not a subject that I was very familiar with. Uh, but generally kind of the early, you know, medieval period, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th centuries kind of uh, Italy. And but it, it kind of has larger implications beyond that. But uh, before we get started, Alvise, why don't you give us uh, an idea about what got you interested in, you know, in Italian history or communal history or basically this subject in general? There's a very interesting Italian I don't know if it's a misconception or let's call it a preconceived notion about the city of Milan, very specifically, that it is the industrial and commercial heart of Italy. Given this, it is a very cold and modern and not a very Italian city. So uh, being Milanese by adoption, uh, I've lived here for many years. I very gradually became interested. I'm an economic historian by training. So uh, I did not study this extensively at university. But living here and then looking into the history of the city, I became increasingly interested on things that are not entirely immediately um, visible here. Uh, the city was rebuilt extensively after the Second World War. So in, I guess, a personal mission to, to, to prove, at least to myself, or uh, maybe I'll eventually, if, if eventually I'll publish something uh, worth publishing. I am interested in communal history or communal Italy because Milan is the, I don't know, is par excellence a phrase in English? Uh, <laughs> example of communal history. And so the idea to look into the history of the city, which isn't entirely evident. And so kind of a mission to dispel preconceived notions on uh, on the city of Milan. So we've been talking uh, kind of uh, around this subject and as if everyone knows what it is, this kind of communal Italy or or medieval communes. Uh, but really, you know, when we're saying this, what are we talking about here? I, I don't th <laughs> I don't think there's I don't think anyone's really quite sure what they're talking about when they talk about uh, communal Italy. I mean, I suppose you could define it as a governing system by which you have these semi autonomous cities in Italy. Um, that don't really fit into the architecture of what we expect medieval Europe to look like politically and economically. Uh, there, there's an argument to be had that nothing in medieval Europe looks like what the conventional knowledge teaches us it was like. But here you really have this 
very interesting. I mean, they're defined most commonly as city states. However, they don't interact as if they're uh, city states. It's just these. This I, I suppose if you had to define it as a um, like to, to give it a sweeping definition, you could just say a, in Italy the com, the communal era was an era, especially in the north, in which there was this system of semi-autonomous self-governing urban communities so you know i, I know the the kind of popular conception of uh, medieval europe is really this kind of uh, i mean a lot of it comes from kind of you know people influenced from like high fantasy and things like that but this idea that there was this kind of tripartite division of society where you had <laughs> you know this, uh, this classical kind of you know you had the the feudal nobles uh, who did all the fighting and roamed around in, in armor and on horseback all day uh, and they were supported by a bunch of you know dirt covered peasants and then there were the <laughs> clergy so you have this like tripartite division i mean when we're looking at I guess that itself is a bit of a uh, false romantic notion, but I mean, it, it, does that just kind of totally break down when we're looking at Northern Italy and say like the 11th century? I don't think it totally breaks down. I mean, feudalism, feudalism, which either exists or doesn't exist, depending on who you're asking or at what point in the historiography you're looking at it. It's, it's, it's a, it's a useful framework, I suppose. You can't really just exclude and say, and just, and just say, oh, well, there, there was, there wasn't any sort of hierarchy in society. There, there definitely was to some extent. It's just nothing is as rigid as, as we're led to believe. I mean, and, and we'll get into this later, but, in Milan, you really, there's no real separation between the bishop and the nobility. The, the bishop is appointed from the nobility and the interests of the bishop are aligned with that of the nobility by and large. Yes. So I think it's, it's a useful framework. I, I mean, you just, if you broad lines, just to think, yes, there were divisions in society and yes, there was a hierarchy, but keep an open mind about it. I, I don't think that's problematic at all. Of course, if you, Learn. I mean, if your if your knowledge of medieval Europe comes from Monty Python's uh, King Arthur and the Holy Grail, that could cause some problems, as it could cause as 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 could uh, getting all your knowledge from Game of Thrones. But but yeah, so so there definitely was a stratified society, but it's not. There's more to it than that. You do have people, or in the merchant, or in the the artisans moving up in society you do get peasants moving to the city or it says i don't i don't like the word peasants or people engaged in agriculture moving to the city you you really have a the society is definitely much more complex than uh <laughs> than what traditional 19th century uh sir walter scott feudalism would have us think well let's let's talk about the the broader political landscape at this time so you know we're really talking about kind of the, the the centuries in between about the 11th and the the 14th century correct yes yeah so i mean what was kind of going on in kind of the larger region of of like western and southern europe at this time where to begin so you you the the Ottonian renaissance which is this period at the second half of the 10th century in germany in which there is a very strong uh ruler a very strong kaiser otto the first in in italy you have this uh this phenomenon whereby after charlemagne's conquest the crown of king of italy is disassociated from the crown of germany and you have these i i, I wouldn't call them petty lords because they are significant political players very powerful significant um, political players but you they they are italians and they they contest the crown of italy almost independently from what is going on in germany so so you have these the and, and the main struggle was between the um the the guideschi whose base of power was in central italy in spoleto and um house of ivrea who earlier they are technically friulians but you know when they do important stuff they're actually based in ivrea which is in northwest italy and so you have this you have you have otto come in right at the end of the 10th century to make a long story short seizing the crown of italy with many interesting uh plots and backstabbing um and you have and and reassociating the crown of italy with that of germany two things happen with otto at this point in time he uses the urban bishops to administer italy because 
he's just defeating the large Italian uh, dukes and marquises. So he's obviously not going to entrust them with the rule of the crown he just in the in the in, in the kingdom he's just seized. And he is also over the Alps. So you have these urban bishops, and it, it, there is a bit of a chicken and the egg argument. Did he empower the urban bishops because they were already powerful? Did was was this the the straw that broke the camel's back with regards to urban power as opposed to a more traditional uh, land? based power that was possibly instituted in in the Lombard period, although the Lombards kind of have this weird dynamic where they pretend to be Roman, and so they they do their best to maintain the urban Roman traditions. Uh, There's an argument to be had that the Mediterranean basin is intrinsically urbanized, so you kind of have to rule through cities. Uh, So what happens is that you have these, these urban bishops becoming real centers of administration and power in Italy. And that kind of, and that kind of creates a scenario and that not even kind of creates a scenario that's almost unique. Um, it doesn't really, it doesn't really have an equivalent in the rest of, in the rest of Europe. I suppose in, in France, maybe you have, uh, Toulouse and Marseille, which on the Mediterranean basin, you have these, these kind of more urbanized communities. And as a matter of fact, that those were the areas that, uh, where, where the king was very easily able to, um, remove large feudal landowners and establish his rule as opposed. You do, I think, have an analogous situation in the south of France where you do have large urban centers and that they work to the detriment of large feudal landholders. And so the king of France is able to assert himself there. In Italy, because the king is across the Alps, these urban communities are kind of left to themselves. So you have this very unique scenario. I mean, it kind of struck me when I was reading up on this that it seemed like there was a bit of a power vacuum. You had Otto come in and kind of break the back or the power structure of kind of the landed nobility. But you also had the, you know, these urban bishops, were, which were not quite uh, analogous to filling that role. And it seems like, you know, when you then factor in that the ultimate authority was up in Germany or on the other side of the mountains and kind of far away, it seems like there was kind of this overarching umbrella of the state that allowed kind of that provided some sort of, you know, overarching authority, but that really it was kind of this benevolent neglect of kind of saying, uh, you guys figure it out on your own. Absolutely. Um, although I wouldn't, I don't think the neglect is benevolent in a sense that you do have uh, German Kaisers descending into Italy every once in a while and uh, trying to assert themselves, wait, no, this is mine. This happened later, I mean, famously with Barbarossa, but I think also in the Salian dynasty, they was a series of, how can I phrase them, legal battles to reaffirm the German right to rule in Italy. Again, the effectiveness of of these attempts to in, to, to assert imperial authority, not very efficient. You get these compromises by German rulers. Every time they descend into Italy, they attempt to compromise with, uh, with the Italian cities in order to get them to acknowledge their rule. And these compromises of course, only lead to the Italian communes becoming more autonomous. Well, let's talk about the the Italian communes then. You know, what kind of form or I guess you could say forms uh, were were these taking? So you have a really, I mean, obviously they do have their roots in the ancient Roman cities. It's very difficult to find cities who uh, do not have a a root in a Roman uh, or urban community founded in the time of the Romans. Uh, notable exceptions are maybe, I think, uh, Alessandria uh, in Piedmont, Venice. For the most part, you have these bishops who are given kind of executive authority. They are the points of reference for the local citizens. Uh, mostly, I mean, when I say citizens, uh, I'm thinking of landowning males uh, for the most part, but you have these um, these people who are going to their bishops for dispute resolution, for rule of law, for defense. the The typical form of government is with the bishop and with uh, with a kind of I don't I don't want to call it a council because that's you know using 
tropes that are very convenient, you know, thinking of the bishop sitting in his throne with the nobles coming to him, or even worse with them, you know, coming to him as, as, in, as in Game of Thrones, asking things of him. It was a really almost, you know, it's a system characterized by the need to balance power. Can we say that there's a, a commonality between these communes? The, apart from the presence of a bishop, you have uh, the thing about Lombardy is that the growth of the city is in tandem with the growth of the agricultural of the of the agricultural landscape. You have this very very fertile, very geographically diverse uh, geography in in Lombardy, and so you have these very powerful agricultural. Um, these very powerful agricultural landowners who, of course, need uh, dispute resolution, who need a who, who need someone to come together to build roads and markets for, I mean, economic economic expansion. For someone to be kind of like the, the neutral party that gets thing gets the, the basic services done. Yes and no. I mean, it's complicated because the bishop is, of course, chosen from the uh, local nobility. You have this kind of it doesn't you don't really get until maybe. I'd say the 13th century, where the Pope is unquestionable, is not is is un, is is not being is able to unquestionably appoint bishops. So it's it's kind of I mean, of course, every city had its own governing system, but it's really um, if I had to give it one defining characteristic, it's just you have this very densely populated landscape where people need a point of authority. And one of the things the bishops had done um, already in the Lombard era and the centuries prior was um, appropriate for themselves the ancient Roman basilicas. Now, for the Romans, basilicas were centers of, uh, were, were a kind of a cross between meeting places and a place where you would get contracts signed and judicial it's kind of a multi-purpose, uh, multi-purpose seat of government. And so you have the bishops move into these basilicas and offer the, the services, which not, not even services, the authority, which, uh, people need. And so in Milan, you have this, um, system by which you have these capitani or, uh, these prominent families who are given the responsibility of carrying out the bishop's will and the capitani and the bishop together are the um, credenza or a Lombard word meaning council. Whereas in Venice, you have a completely different setup. You have a setup where um, the, you have these merchants living in Malamocco and these landowners living in Eraclea to the north and they converge on the islands of the Rialto, which are halfway there, to argue and occasionally murder each other. So you really, there's there's no real pattern to how this happened. You just have people coming together, uh, looking for a, or needing a, a point of authority. But, I mean, I think this goes back to what we were talking about in the very beginning here, which is that it seems like these kind of are ad hoc systems that form out of kind of an absence of a central authority, or at least mm-hmm. an absence of a strong central authority. You know, how much of, of kind of when we talk about like communal Italy or communal, uh, the communal uh, societies in medieval Europe and generally, I mean, how much of that is kind of, you know, historians lumping together things together because it's more convenient for them rather than it being more reflective of the reality on the ground? Oh, absolutely. I think there's a, especially in up until maybe 50 years ago, you had this, uh, this, this kind of this, this idea where all the cities were kind of not just, not just the same, but you kind of have this idea where the communal system just comes out of nowhere in which, um, you know, the, the, there's an Italian phrase, la rinascita dell'anno mille, the rebirth of the year 1000, as if in the year 1000, everyone was like, oh, the, I'm, this, this was actually in my elementary school textbook saying that after the year 1000, people thought the world was going to end when they saw it didn't happen. Oh, well, let's build cities. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's absurd. Um, and so you do have this tendency to clump everything, everything together. Uh, fortunately now, you, and I, I like to think that I'm at least uh, documenting or very, very attuned with this idea in which you have this kind of civic pride and uh, people are looking into the histories of uh, their city. And uh, at the University of Milan, there are uh, in the last 20 years, there have been more papers published. The real 
I think point at which we can say the historiography of the era changed was in 1976. In that date, the uh, president of the Italian Republic commissioned a extensive study on the Battle of Legnano for its um, 800 year anniversary. And it was the battle in which the Lombard communes, sorry. I was going to say, this is the battle where essentially the Italian city-states or communes or whatever uh, kind of asserted their independence from the Holy Roman Empire, correct? Yes, it's, 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 the, it's not a final confrontation because you do get uh, descendants of, of Barbarossa coming into Italy, but they're really the, this is the end of the real military confrontation, which putting, puts an end to the legal argument by which the uh, Holy Roman Emperor is also king of Italy. After this, this study took a very critical view for the scholarship and, and the, the, the chronicles at the time. You, you have, especially in the battle, there was this, there's, there's this, um, one chronicler who added many legendary <laughs> aspects to the, uh, to the story of the battle. And you finally have the idea where really let's, let's compare sources and figure out what is happening. Uh, especially in the communal era, in Milan, you have these four primary chronicles. Uh, one is authorless. The other three are uh, written between the 11th and um, 13th centuries. And uh, you really have to you really have to pick and choose and what and and as to what. It, it as, seems as like to, maybe they they don't all agree on the. Oh no, they 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 absolutely that's that's a given. They don't they don't agree on anything. But uh, you especially especially the last one, Galvano Fiamma, who was the uh, personal chaplain of Giovanni Visconti. Uh, this is less than a generation after the communal system had been definitively dismantled. Uh, Garbano Fiamma is writing not only to exalt the Visconti, but also using the lens of a, he was a, uh, he was his personal chaplain. So he's using the lens of a Milanese cleric and writing of the history of Milan and their interaction with other cities as if all cities had the same structure. That's clearly not the case. I mean, I'm not an expert on Bergamo and Brescia, or I don't know as much as I do on Milan, but they're definitely very different. There you have these, uh, you have a much stronger uh, middle class in those cities, whereas in Milan, you kind of have this convergence of, uh, of a very strong aristocracy, and that uh, mediated the system of government. Florence was also completely different. In Florence, you really have, uh, and I, this maybe has to do with the fact that Tuscany is a little more pastoral and less suited towards uh, intensive agriculture as uh, Lombardy. But you definitely, ha there you have a, not only a much larger uh, middle class, but also you don't have this phenomenon in Milan where the large uh, territorial landowners are in the city, the Capitani. In Florence, you have the Medici, who were um, most probably um, vassals of the Counts Ubaldini, who had and the Medici, the vassals, moved to the city, whereas the uh, in the I think I think the first mention of a medico in Florence is in the 12th century, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, whereas the Ubaldini gave us a cardinal in in the same century, and we never hear from them again. So it's definitely it's it's definitely there. Definitely is a tendency to pick and choose, especially because so much has been written. You had this era in Italian history after Italian unification in which you had these writers who were almost rediscovering their, their histories. And, 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 and you still see them today. I mean, there's the L'Enciclopedia Trecciani, which is one of the most important historical encyclopedias in Italy, is still cites these 18th century, um, sorry, these 19th century authors, because there's still a lot to be done. There's still a lot more to, to look into as to what precisely happened. This wasn't like uh, a sudden uprising in democratic spirit, you know, with dozens of, of Italian Athens blooming across the country and kind of a, a, a Milanese Socrates opining on the correct system of government. Um, I don't think so. No, I don't think you have a, at this system, everyone, or if, if, if there is maybe one person exalting a kind of system of government over another in the cities. I mean, was there like kind of a, a commonality of thought or a philosophy of the communes? I wouldn't say that there was a commonality of thought. There is definitely a, there's definitely a phenomenon by which these communes are really born out of the people coming together. And so you have these 
personal strengths and weaknesses shaping how government takes shape. It's not, it's, it's incorrect to, to assume it was entirely like this, but it's, it's, it's almost like a, almost like a popularity contest in which you have these, these different factions buying for control within the city. And so really, because the system is born out of necessity, there wasn't really a theory behind it. Also, because the people meeting together were not always, or I would say were seldom friendly. And so you don't really have anyone exalting their communal rule, because if it was up to them, they would dismantle it. Um, you have the most powerful family in, I mean, you know, in this again, feudalism is problematic because it existed and it didn't. I mean, you have the most powerful family in the uh, 13th century in, in Milan, the Della Torre, who were counts of the Valsassina. So they do have feudal holdings. And in the borough of Prima Luna, which is this fortified town where they rule paramount. And then they come to Milan, or they are also, and, and they hold these lands as vassals of the office of bishop. So there is an element of absolutism. But then they come to Milan and they have to get along with the De Grassi and they have to get along with the Argentea and they have to get along, along with the Visconti. And, and of course, and, you know, also with, with the bishops, the bishops um, are selected from these families. So you don't get people writing saying, oh, yes, our bishop is so kind and generous. As a matter of fact, you have the most powerful bishop in Milan in the 11th century, whose name obviously escapes me because as soon as, you know, you need to remember someone's name, you forget it. Um, Arnulf of Arsago. He ends his term as bishop exiled from Milan because a popular upright uprising has uh, chased him from the city. So I don't think the conditions are there to create to create a kind of to, 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 for someone to sit down and say, oh, yes, our commune is better than your commune. Or you do have people saying our commune is better than your commune. I mean, noticeably, uh, I think uh, Bobezin de la Riva writes uh, his chronicle is uh, literally called De Magnalibus Urbi Mediolani, the magnificent Milanese city. And the chronicle is basically him going how magnificent uh, my city is. But he doesn't mention, he doesn't talk about government. He talks about how magnificent the people in the city are because the government is a function of people coming together and figuring out is it easier to find a resolution or is it easier for me to kill you? We, we've already kind of started talking about it, uh, but let's let's focus in on, on Milan and really, you know, you mentioned a bunch of names, by, uh, you know, just a, just a few minutes ago. But, you know, who were the, the major, what were the major power blocks in Milan that were having to find out how to get along with each other? So you have a <laughs> you have a very intricate web of power. So along broad lines, there are three uh, factions. They are the Capitani who were the large landowners. And originally, in the 11th century, Milan was ruled by the bishop who delegated rule to the Capitani. Now, eventually, what, what happens is, is that the, they're described both as vavasors of the... Um, is that, am I pronouncing that right? In Italian, it's valvasori. Are you asking me? <laughs> okay. Um, well, the, the, the Vavasors, which I hope is the English translation of Valvasori, uh, they constitute a second frac faction, uh, who, who enters in play, who enters, who enters the political landscape when Conrad the Salic, uh, ascends to the throne of Germany and attempts to reassert imperial rule in Italy. And the way Conrad does this is that when he is in Italy, he manages to get himself crowned, uh, king of Italy in the cathedral of Milan by emanating a decree that the Vavasors or minor landholders must have a representative in the bishop's council along with the captains. The Vavasors, of course, very much like this bull, if the, this imperial bull. If it is not applied, they threaten to revolt. And so you have the entrance of the second large faction in, um, in Milanese politics. In, for, in, in 1042, the Bishop of Milan, for a power play which kind of backfires, decrees that the Chives, or non-land owning citizens, are also entitled to electing 
a representative to the council. So from the middle of the 11th century on, you have these three power blocks. You have the uh, Vavasors, who are colloquially in Milanese called La Motta, and the Capitani. And the, the Motta and the Capitani are kind of the old established order who, in great part, oppose the middle class uh, artisans. There is a mostly antagonistic uh, antagonistic relationship between these two factions, um, but it doesn't really compare to the antagonism within the factions. Uh, the Capitani were not above um, murdering and killing each other and taking up arms <laughs> against each other. Uh, you have the the Capitani, the most powerful Capitani, were the uh, the so called delle porte. Uh, of the doors. Now, what this means is that in the, according to Galvano Fiamma, and this is, you know, debatable, the Capitani dates to the time of St. Ambrose. Every prominent family was given one city gate to defend. Through and, th- and so through the ages, you have these largest, although there were other families who had the title Capitani, who were direct vassals of the bishop and were given special responsibilities to uh, maintain roads and, uh, and, and take up arms to defend the city in time of war. The primary factions were De La Torre, Da Baggio, De Busti, Argentea, who interestingly are in later documents referred to as Da Porta Orientale, which means literally from the western gate, or from, yeah, uh, from the eastern gate, sorry. And, and that's, that's kind of interesting to see how their kind of urban designation has eclipsed their older feudal designation and, uh, the Caronia and, uh, Grassi. Uh, interesting thing, the, the interesting thing about these is that you can, these names are repeated in place names around Milan to this day. So Da Baggio, their base of power was in the borough of, uh, Baggio, which is still a town to this day, as are De Busti, were from Busto, which if you, uh, which is uh, the town where the airport is located uh, nowadays. And so you, these, these, there were within the noble fraction, faction, these large families, which of course had a large following of less powerful families. And so you really have this stratified, uh, these, these layers of intrigue. And, and Milan itself is, is like growing rapidly at this time, right? Cause you know, you just said that, you know, they, they had their, you know, these, these Capitanis and you know, these kind of more major landholders. They essentially had like kind of, uh, it sounds like they had kind of towns of their own central power base, but that they would have been kind of, by the time period that we're talking about, those are basically the suburbs of Milan, I guess you could say. Oh, absolutely. So Milan is really unique in a sense that not only is it really massive. I mean, it's a, of all the urban communities in the, uh, the Italian communal period, it is by far the largest. There are estimates which place the population very, very high, like, which, which I, I, I doubt, I find it pretty absurd, but some, some people, um, uh, to, 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 uh, yeah, notably Roberto Bellatosta at the University of Milan, who puts the population in the year 1000 at um, one, at 100,000 inhabitants. Which would make it pretty much the biggest city in Europe at the time outside of Constantinople. I mean, yeah, it's uh, although it's it is unclear, though, I mean, if it, depending what counting me- mechanism he used because of the fact that there was extensive suburbanization, definitely is one of the biggest cities in Europe. I don't know. I don't know if I would put it on par with Constantinople. Again, Roberto Bellatosta's estimates are generous. Uh, however, he possibly is also counting. Uh, also, pro- depending on the way he counted, he probably included the suburbs of the city, which were very extensive. Uh, the Lombard Plain is crossed by waterways, and uh, up until all the way back to the Roman era, the the area really has been characterized by natural and man-made waterways. And so you have this very easy influx of people and uh, goods and services into the city. And uh, that makes for a very, not not just having a web of uh, smaller uh, towns around the city, but also uh, creates the development of along, along the roads connecting, uh, along the roads and canals connecting Milan to the surrounding towns uh, you have this kind of, this, this phenomenon of suburbanization. And, uh, you def, you, you, you even have this phenomenon by which, um, all across the socioeconomic spe- spectrum from, uh, 
farmers to landowners moving to the city, not permanently, but for specific periods of time. You have maybe in a family with uh, three children, one goes to Milan and returns and, uh, and, and does a bit of back and forth. I, I don't know if I would call it commuting because uh, it's, not, it's not like they would go for the day and then come back, come back home for the evening, but you do have this connection with the, uh, with the countryside. So, so we're not just dealing with more of a, like a singular city. We're dealing more with kind of like a, an economic network. Oh, abs- absolutely. And you can, and you can extend the network, uh, as the, the farther out you move, the, the more the network expands. I mean, you know, once the, uh, once the area of influence of Milan ends, the area of influence of Bergamo begins. And so, and, and so on and so forth. And then Brescia and then Verona until you reach Venice. And so you, you have this interconnected, um, beyond Milan, you have this interconnected network of cities. But Milan especially is notable for how massive it is. You have this really this this the density of population could be argued to 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 last to have lasted um, since since the Roman era. You don't really have a phenomenon like that you ha- like the one you have in Rome, where after a large population decline in the uh, in late antiquity, the center of the city moves several miles to the north. Uh, the urban centers of the the urban focal po- the medieval focal points of Milan are. Are, are yards away from the from the from the Roman focal points. The Piazza Duomo is 540 yards from the Roman Forum, and the um, Piazza Cordusio exactly 500 yards from the uh, ancient Imperial Palace. So we have kind of Milan, the Eternal City. Ab- oh, well, you know, as I am, I am a very biased towards Milan, and I would say yes. <laughs> Well, let's talk about because you know we we've mentioned all these other city states. You know, what was kind of the? I guess you could say you know when we're looking at these kind of like the major nobility of the Capitani and the the minor nobility of the the uh, the, of the, the Valsal- Valvasors or call the them yeah they're yeah, they're Valvasors. called. A number of things, depending on who's writing. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then, of course, the the kind of I guess you could say artisan, professional, middle class of the yes. of the Chives. You know, what was what was their what was their foreign policy? I mean, where did these where did these groups disagree on how to get along with all the rest of the you know the communal cities and and uh, other foreign powers around them? Oh well, you have this. Um, Milan is definitely one of the bully cities in North Italy, where. Um, there is the realization that Milan, Milan, the etymology of Milan is Mediolanum, in the middle of the plain. Great for constructing a big commercial city, not so good for defending the, uh, the said city. So you do have this necessity for aggressive expansion. And the Capitani realize this themselves. They uh, go to great lengths to seize and acquire castles and boroughs um, and burgs around around the city of Milan. And it's a large, it's a big, big point of, of contention, which you have by the time Barbarossa comes, uh, comes, comes to Italy, the other Italian cities are itching to set the record straight after they have what they believe are transgressions by which the Milan's, Milanese Capitani are amassing these, these fortresses closer to their borders. All said, you, given this, uh, so, so that set aside with the aggressive kind of expansionist ideas of the Capitani, the, the commercial class tends to be more pacifist. And you have, and, and you see this in cities, um, in Italy in the period with a large commercial class. They tend to not want to get involved in warfare, uh, notably Venice. Uh, Venice has made a policy of themselves to not interfere on mainland Italian politics. Also, early history of Florence, although Florence kind of does a, does a 180 and becomes very aggressive towards the, um, the 14th century. But you have, so for the most part, the artisans are not very into the whole aggression thing. However, um, the way the ruling class gets them uh, to kind of agree, especially in the large conflicts with uh, German emperors, the way the uh, the nobility gets the uh, the the artisans on board is by giving them more privileges. So the artisans were um, were united in a uh, the various art, artist associations, which aren't really guilds because when we think of medieval guilds, we think of these medieval monopolies. These were more 
associations um, focused on economic expansion and uh, pooling capital to sell goods abroad or produce more goods or produce goods depending on the various demand in different markets. These associations were united in the Credenza di Sant'Ambrogio, which is a very interesting name because the Bishop's Council was called the Credenza del Vescovo. So they're basically saying that their credenza answers to St. Ambrose, whereas the city's credenza answers to the bishop. So it's a very interesting way. It, it, I think it shows how they perceived religious authority or as, you know, religious authority evidently was a just a different form of uh, political authority. And so so the credenza di Sant'Ambrogio is uh, rep- represents artisans in the council, we unfortunately don't know how, we don't know what the election process was, um, but you definitely have a more of a less aggressive policy from, from the artisans. And then once you, uh, once, once Milan is after, after the wars against Barbarossa, when Milan is the unquestionable dominant power in the Lombard plain, you almost have this implosion by which you have the Podesta system last for 70 years until Milan moves from this communal system to a more despotic system. And then the expansion really goes into overdrive. Well, and I do kind of want to eventually get to that. But, you know, to go back to this idea, because you just mentioned that it's really unclear about how, you know, the, the election system for this the credenza of, of St. Ambrose work, you know, but I mean, how was how did the, the general overall system of government in Milan work at this time? Um, clearly, the the smart aleck answer would be not very well but you know what were the actual <laughs> no it worked very well that's actually uh <laughs> sorry if i sorry if i interrupted you but... <laughs> no but i mean okay so yeah that's why it's a smart aleck answer but um you know how did it actually how did the arrangement of it work I mean, were there regular meetings were were there elections you know how did how did you get appointed and and get into this kind of system of government so it worked surprisingly well. Uh, you originally the system was w- in which the bishop had his capitani, and it was the job of the capitani to carry out the will of the bishop. The idea is that if they're carrying out the will of the bishop and working together, they're less prone to kill each other. After a while, this system becomes very clumbersome. You need to have there's it's too early to be speaking about a professional bureaucracy. But there needs to be a, or the Milanese realize that there needs to be a meritocratic system of, um, of choosing who is running the show. And so Milan moves from this, uh, bishop's council where we don't, uh, unfortunately chronicles don't, we don't, we don't have like, uh, you know, today the bishop's council met for the fourth time and they can't agree on what the tolls over the Seviso bridge needs to be. Um, I wish, but that's not the case. It's more like, uh, the bishop's council met and decreed that such and such happened after much deliberation. Um, we, so we don't have the, the minutes of the meeting. Unfortunately not. No. <laughs> um, um, after the, um, after, after this realization, after, after they come to realize there needs to be a kind of not professional, but way to choose who is the best man for the job, Milan moves from this councillor government to this consular government in which there was a city consul chosen. Um, we don't really know how the first one was chosen, but we do know that uh, the consul chose his successor and he had to be uh, vetted by the um, by the bishop and the council and who who voted. I, we don't know if, if, if a simple majority was enough or the decision had to be unanimous, but he was chosen by his predecessor on advice of the, of the, uh, of the council. And it was the consul's job to run the city, organize public works and decide taxation. And of course, this consul, the urban consul was, um, paired with a Council of Justice. And the Council of Justice job was to uh, organize the court system. Uh, and this was, of course, necessary because the chivas or artisans were not very happy at all with the fact that the uh, highest judicial authority was the worth the Council of the Capitani. Of course, the Capitani are going to rule against the artisans whenever they have to, whenever they come up against a um, other captain or a uh, babasaur. So actually, you know, you're kind of you're kind of going on to what I was going to ask next is that, you know, we've discussed 
foreign policy, as you say, where, you know, Milan had this very kind of aggressive foreign policy, you know, in part necessitated by its geographic location. But what were the what were the internal disputes about, you know, kind of domestic policy, if you would, uh, between these three kind of power blocks? And you have already mentioned the fact that court reform was of interest. Yes. <laughs> so internally, I mean, the 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 idea is that the um, the the constitution of markets and the uh, regulation of trade was the purview of the bishop, who was always almost always a member of the nobili- nobility, or was always a member of the nobility, almost always a uh, member of a of a family of capitani. So you definitely have this uh, desire by the by the artisans for a more liberal kind of economy. However, apart from the occasional disputes on construction of markets and uh, roads, of course, the nobles don't want to spend money to build roads on their uh, on the uh, going through their estates, whereas the merchants are very much uh, are would would very much rather them there there be more of them. Interestingly enough, internally, the divisions they everyone I wouldn't say get, gets along fine, but you you really do have this. Uh, some resemblance of stability. This this kind of is reflected in the way the Milanese um, the the Milanese professional associations worked. Professional associations were in Milan, which is very different from what was happening in the rest of uh, Western Europe. Were focused on exporting goods and uh, meeting demand and getting goods to foreign markets. They were not interested in or less interested in protecting internal production and protecting uh, their knowledge and protecting their their means of production, which I think is very interesting. So the communal the, uh, the communal rule really it's apart from the moment when you know it's it's kind of this this I mean it seems like there was some kind of uh, I guess you could say internal agreement that the city itself is working just fine. Absolutely, absolutely. So the city itself is definitely working fine, and yes, you do have disputes, but for, by and by and large, there, it sounds like there are kind this. of disputes at the margins rather than over kind of the the core principles of how the city is run. And yeah, well, you do have the you do have the artisans trying to get their foot in and trying to increase their power. However, you you know there there is definitely. A frustration with the fact that uh, the artisans were fundamentally second-rate citizens. You know, you have the idea where to fight Barbarossa, the uh, the the artisans are able to uh, negotiate uh, the fact that yes, they're going to take up arms along with the captains and the knights, but all negotiations between the city authorities and external authorities, be they Barbarossa or who else, have to have a consul selected by the artisans there participating in, in negotiations, which is a major victory. I mean, they had a representative at the highest negotiations of state. The presence of a consul selected by the artisans lasts about 50 years. So you definitely, you have a very, very powerful Landed, uh, landed elite. Maybe this comes from the fact that Lombardy is very, very fertile, so you do have land revenues are very, uh, very abundant. Maybe the fact that there was less disruption in Lombardy, so there was less chances for the the citizens or poor or lower classes exert privileges. Uh, it could be that it was densely populated, so the value of a single worker was much lower. Um, but you do have this kind of like, every chance they can get, the, the artisans try to increase their role in government. But the nobility is very good at oppressing them. Was there ever kind of like a, I guess you could say like a, uh, a consul who was kind of a, a populist noble who wanted to kind of become, you know, sort of, a, I guess you could say, uh, to harken back to classical times again, kind of a, a tribune of the masses where uh, where while he had kind of a noble status, uh, he was also kind of uniting this this kind of professional class behind him to kind of consolidate power. Absolutely. the uh, It happened in 1241 when Martino della Torre um, used uh, popular support to oppose 
the uh, appointment of one Paulo Sorezina as consul. And it sparked the end of the Milanese commune. <laughs> well, you know, what, what happened there? And you've also mentioned something called a, a podesta. Is that when we start seeing this come in? Or is, is, is that kind yes. of an earlier thing? So after Barbarossa, um, the Barbarossa descends in Italy about like seven times before the Milanese are able to mount an efficient, uh, an efficient defense. Part of that is because the other Italian cities gang up on Milan. They're willing to concede and recognize the uh, the emperor's rule in Italy if they can get rid of this bully city. However, there was the Milanese didn't really help themselves in a sense that the uh, consuls who were making decisions needed to get these decisions through this council. You really had again communal government is characterized by people coming together. And these people have their own interests and their own agendas. Not all of the uh, not all of the capitani wanted the city to be autonomous from the emperor. And so there was really a need to create an executive or to create an ex- executive decision making process. The system by which a podesta was selected is unclear. Uh, normally he was a prominent citizen of another city. However, there are also mentions of the Podesta being a group of people. Specifically, if Martino de la Torre, who was as Milanese as they go, could proclaim himself Podesta in 1241, he does have to proclaim like someone else co-Podesta after an uprising, but he's pretty much calling the shots. So it's really a system by which the city recognized there needed to be an executive decision-making process, which interestingly is the opposite decision-making process, the opposite decision which the Venetians took. The Venetians had a very strong executive who just piled councils and uh, bodies of uh, bodies of deliberation up until up to render him ineffective. Um, and here you have the opposite, the appointment of a single executive to um, make decisions. So you do have this podesta, but again, once he's created, the setup lasts... Um, I think maybe about 50 years. So the Podesta was established at the end of the 12th century after uh, the wars against Barbarossa are won. The system is adopted. And then in 1241, you have Martino de la Torre using popular support to proclaim himself uh, Podesta and all hell breaks loose. (laughs) So, I mean, is that really where we can draw the line and say, well, that is that is the end of communal Milan? I would say yes. Up, up in 1241, after 1241, you have this struggle between these two dynasties, the De La Torre, who were very powerful landed elites who used popular support to get their way, and the Visconti, uh, initially represented by the person of Ottone Visconti, or in English, Otto Visconti, who was the bishop at the time and who worked with the nobility to get Martino out of the way. And so you get a period of about 50 years in which uh, not only is the city contested, but the lands around the city are contested because, of course, you have this system by which during popular uprising, people, especially important uh, citizens, get expelled from the city. So they return to their country estates and try to build up support. And um, I mean, a lot of people like to think that these are the urban nobility only lived in the city. But, you know, again, feudalism didn't exist, but it kind of did. They could call on retinues of armed knights. They could, at times, assemble large, large forces of uh, large forces of men at arms who could have uh, significant confrontations. And at the end of this period, the Visconti don't really you, you don't really see them use the titles of monarchs up until the mid 14th century when a match is being made between uh, Valentina Visconti and the Dauphin of France in which they they kind of say uh, a request in the form of lots of money is sent to Emperor Sigismund making uh, the Visconti Dukes of Milan, although it's debatable as to whether Sigismund has a title, had any authority to create that title to begin with. You have the uh, the ruler of Milan adopts the title the Signore, which literally means uh, Lord, and so they they're just 
they don't really dismantle the communal institutions. You still have the consuls of justice uh, running the court system. You still have an urban consul controlling the city planning and urbanization process. But there is an unquestion, there is the unquestionable existence of a single authority figure whose power is dynastic. You know, what we talked about earlier at the beginning of this episode, it was that part of this kind of system of communal government arose because there, there was no singular authority. But, you know, over the centuries, it sounds like power became more and more consolidated in certain people and certain, you know, uh, power blocks and certain dynasties uh, to the point where essentially, you know, one of them was able to, to kind of make a final ultimate assertion of its power. Absolutely. You have, um, you, you definitely have this concentration of, uh, of power. And it's, it's a trend that, that really carries on in all Italian cities apart from Venice, which again, weird situation. But um, you definitely have this consolidation of power into the hands of single people or more often single dynasties. Um, the options are really two. By the end of, by the, no, by the 14th century, either one person or one dynasty exerts, manages to subdue all the others in a city, or a city is uh, absorbed by a larger, more powerful polity. So in Tuscany, you have um, you have first uh, first Siena and Pisa come are effectively conquered by Florence, and then in Florence the political system breaks down with one dynasty ruling over the others. I mean, it's, it's just it's it's a function of the way communal governments are. I mean, communal governments were these the the collection of people, these people who look to the urban bishops initially to solve disputes, but I suppose what I'm trying to say is that the Visconti uh, did not think of themselves as Milanese. The Visconti thought of themselves as Visconti. And the same way the Medici, maybe they gave some importance to the issue of Florentineness, but the Medici, and also because when the Medici came to power, Florence was the unquestioning political force in Tuscany. As a matter of fact, it was the only political force in Tuscany. So really, they can they could afford to be both Florentine. Uh, Flo- they could consider themselves both Florentines and Medici. But really, you have this. Um, you have this. You have. Def- there's definitely an opportunism about uh, about the political system at the time. It's if you you do have situations where people compromise their city uh, for power. Uh, again, in the conflicts with Barbarossa, uh, Anselmo da Dovara was a minor noble of, um, of Itzelino da Romano, who was Podesta of Treviso and Vicenza. Again, here, the Podesta system is kind of weird because Itzelino da Romano was a very powerful landholder in the area of Treviso, and he manages to be Podesta of uh, Treviso and Vicenza. Go figure. I mean, <laughs> I don't think he was chosen for his impartiality. He was probably chosen because he, you know, was literally the most powerful person in the area. But you have Anselmo da Dovaro basically selling out the city of Treviso to Emperor Barbarossa in exchange for power. When, of course, this is, oh, I'm, I'm rambling here, but this is when uh, Itzelino da Romano was in um, Alessandria because he threw in his lot with the Lombard cities. But I'm digressing. Yeah, well, actually, I, I kind of want to bring us to kind of towards an epilogue here because, you know, we've, we've gone through the establishment of the, the Milanese commune and talked about the communal system and, and you know, brought us to the end of the Milanese commune and into kind of the, the series of wars that would then start to rack Italy for the next, you know, couple hundred years. But to, to kind of bring us to an, an epilogue here, uh, you know, what is... What is the kind of the the long term lasting effects of these communal systems, uh, you know, in Italy today and in Milan in particular? You know, how do they echo down to the ages to us? So I think um, the idea that in Italy you don't have a single national identity really comes from this era. It cannot have come from. It, it really cannot have come from any earlier. Uh, any earlier period in time. I mean, the idea that um, the, the, the concept of the Civitas Romanus, I am a Roman citizen, really doesn't exist 
there's there's no equivalent idea in Italy afterwards the way there could be in um, I'm thinking of France or England Germany and Spain are effectively different but also in Germany and also in Spain you might hear someone identify as a Castilian or as a Catalan but very seldom will uh, unless we're talking about soccer teams very seldom would someone point out to the differences of um Barcelona and Valencia whereas the differences between Milan and Genova are enormous both culturally and uh, with language and uh, historically so i think part of the issue part of the italian the, the non part of the non-existence of an italian national identity really comes from this era the idea the idea of urban pride or civic pride which uh, um, exists in italy in a particularly fervent form Overall, I think the heritage of the of the communal era is visible everywhere. I mean, in most of the urban traditions in Italian cities, date from this era. The uh, Palio of Siena dates uh, dates from this era. The urban the urban fabric of Italian cities really dates from the really dates from this era when cities not only grew organically but you had citizens coming together to structure their to 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 build something you know it's a it's 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 a bit difficult to explain it's kind of a solidification of the identity around the city rather than uh, something kind of a larger overarching political mm-hmm. entity oh abso- absolutely and i think also a part of the i think tragedy of italian history is the fact that there was no i mean it- italy and after the early modern era is subject to foreign powers mainly because italian powers could not could not unify and there is no italian state until 1861 i think that is also a heritage of no, it's it's definitely a heritage of this this era. I mean, previously there was a kingdom of Italy. There were three kingdoms of Italy. There was a Ostrogothic, a Romano, uh, Romano Gothic kingdom of Italy. There was a Lombard kingdom of Italy, and there was the very much contested post Frankish kingdom of Italy, where there was a unified polity. Of course, the ruler of the polity was uh, the rulers of the polity were basically playing games of musical chairs. But really, uh, before Otto wipes out these large landowners you these large feudal nobility call them whatever you want you really had you you really had the poss or i feel at least you had the possibility that italy would turn into a medieval and then postmodern state the fact that the com- because of a m- number of events that happened in the communal era and also because of the intrinsic characteristics of northern italy that can't happen after uh, afterwards, and and I think, I mean, of course, in Milan you have this um, the heritage of the communal era, especially architecturally, has been very much wiped out. Um, as I said in the beginning, the idea that Milan has a, an illustrial history that starts long before the Italian economic boom of the nineteen sixties is. Um, kind of not very visible but for that reason i think it is much more valuable and i think because milan has um, has has had so much immigration from the rest of italy uh it's really the only the only part of italy to have had so much internal migration you don't really have this uh i i, I at least i i think it's i don't you know the heritage of this era has definitely some influence on the urban planning, the idea of the city, the fact that Milan was one of the first Italian cities to significantly suburbanize after after the Second World War. Suburbs are a characteristic of uh, no Italian city apart from Milan, and that's partly because you have, yes, the canal system. Uh, you have the idea of these large urban landholders expanding their uh, areas of influence far beyond the city's borders. You have the idea where the primary position of Milan as an economic powerhouse emerges in this era. However, I, I, it's, I think it's also an important era to study, and it's not gotten as much attention as it should, 
because it's not an easy era to study. There's a lot of contradicting uh, chronicles. There is a lot of bias, both by chroniclers and uh, and historians. I attempted to create cohesive arguments and lost myself in my notes just to tell you how convoluted this history is. And so I think I think because of because Milan has been so radically changed, it's important to study and realize that there is a reason the city is the way it is. And, you know, just just little little details, which I think a lot of people overlook. Well, Elvise, I want to thank you so much uh, for talking with us on the Ask Torrance podcast today. Uh, thanks. Thanks for having me and not getting frustrated with my incoherent and uh, and uh, long winded rambling. And as always, a big thanks to you, our listeners, for doing what you do, which is listening and enjoying a long-winded um, kind of conversations about uh, in-depth historical topics, which is, I guess, what we're all here for. It's certainly why I'm here. Uh, and a big thanks to our Patreon supporters as well. If you want to join those illustrious ranks, you may go to patreon.com forward slash askhistorians. A special thanks to one of those supporters, Reddit user 40 Freak, for being so generous with their support of the show. So I, I hope you really saw how this period of time, this you know communal Italy under the Holy Roman Empire, but more with kind of a focus on local control, but with kind of an absence of an absolute local uh, executive authority, but one that kind of evolved over time through a series of ad hoc processes, kind of sets out the, the stage for, um, if you know your Italian history, it kind of sets out the stage for the next few centuries of Italian history. As Alvise was, was talking about at the end there, there wasn't really... Uh, an Italian state until 1860, and the Italian peninsula itself really wasn't unified until I think 1870, with the inclusion of the papal states into you know at that point you know uh, the Italy, <laughs> this is the, the the nation state we now call Italy. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this episode and really got a, a good look at um, northern Italy at this time and Milan in particular. I really enjoy it. Uh, when someone has kind of this great civic pride and then they're talking about how, you know, four, five, six hundred, seven hundred years ago, people also had this great civic pride in their own city. Uh, it's pretty great to see how that kind of echoes, echoes down through history. As we come up on uh, our next kind of two-parter for this, they're independent episodes, of course, with different people, but I, I just felt that they kind of complement each other very well. Uh, so next week, we're going to be coming up and having, uh, not next week, next episode, which is in two weeks. Um, we don't do a weekly schedule. It'll be difficult. Please Please don't make me do it. So our next episode will be uh, jumping forward to the 1920s and 30s and 40s and talking about how the Italian fascists tried to kind of forge an Italian national identity. And we'll be looking at the role that uh, the sport of football, or calcio, as the Italians call it, uh, played in that in that. So until next time, you can always find all the episodes on uh, on we're on SoundCloud, we are on Google Play, we are on iTunes. Uh, you can also just go directly to askhistorians.libsyn. Uh, it's L I B syn.com so askhistorians.libsyn.com and that's kind of our, our main uh it's like our main page where you can find all the episodes just kind of listed in blog form and as mentioned at the top of the show we do a discussion post on the reddit subform ask historians every uh for every one of these episodes uh, and so you can go there to uh, reddit.com forward slash r forward slash ask historians and browse uh all sorts of wonderful questions and uh, ask questions for the guest about this uh, topic or about me about the podcast in general so hope you enjoyed the show we will see you in two weeks you've been listening to the ask historians podcast for more history like this visit us at reddit.com slash r slash ask historians and ask over a hundred historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know in history find us on twitter as at ask historians and subscribe to the show on iTunes. Or visit askhistorians.libsyn.com. Thank you very much for listening, and join us next time on the Ask Historians podcast.